Hello! Did you know that practically everything you own is produced by only a single company? Well, that's only slightly hyperbolic. The vast majority of things you own or consume daily are things produced by an ever-decreasing handful of giant producers who have near total control over the market and your life. We'll discuss the US mostly, but this is valid for practically every country on Earth. Under capitalism, most of the supposed variety that exists is only artificial. One single massive conglomerate with hundreds of sub-brands underneath producing basically everything from shampoo to medicine. Toothpaste is a perfect example. Go to any grocery store and gaze in awe of the hundreds upon hundreds of boxes. Take a look at any number of them to find out that magically they're all made by either Colgate Palmolive or Procter & Gamble, the makers of Crest. Candy isn't any different. Just three companies make practically every candy on Earth. Mondelez International, Mars Incorporated, and the Hershey Company. Medicine is the same. Over a standard lifetime, you'll only really encounter two companies, Pfizer and GSK. Even in death, Hillenbrand caskets make up 50% market share of all caskets made. The other half belongs to, unsurprisingly, one other company. This is reproduced even in day-to-day -day things you wouldn't even think about. Meta owns Facebook, Messenger, Instagram, and WhatsApp, things that the bulk of humanity uses at some point or another throughout their day. Retail with Walmart, Amazon with many specific lines of business, eyeglasses with Luxottica, mattresses, dairy, meat, airlines, glass, alcohol, appliances. Think about it, and there will most likely be at most four major producers that absolutely dominate the landscape, with the number decreasing year by year. The traditional argument for capitalism that allows for variety really does fall flat. At its core, capitalism tends towards monopoly. Marx termed this decentralization of capital, and is not only a natural process of the system, but also absolutely necessary. When there is market competition, different entities compete, and some lose out while others win. When they do win, do they let the loser keep their market share? Of course not. The winners slowly, or not so slowly, consolidate a bigger and bigger market share into themselves, cornering the market and establishing themselves as the key player in that particular industry. Another unchanging myth of capitalism, that of the small business, also falls flat in relation to this development. Small businesses logically provide mostly small-scale services to mostly local customers. They employ a few dozen workers at most and source their own materials from other companies, usually large conglomerates. Slowly but surely, small businesses either end up becoming large capitalists, joining the ranks of those conglomerates we've spoken about, or they are bought out, are outcompeted, or simply go under. The latter, of course, being the most common by a large margin. This is a fundamental and characteristic development of capitalism that stands in direct contradiction to the established ideological doctrine of those that promote capitalism. In essence, this is yet another example of capitalist projection, in which a core feature of capitalism is thrown onto and claimed to be a shortcoming of socialism. With the concentration of capital comes concentration of wealth too. We should distinguish between those who own the wealth of society and those who have to work for a living. The former, who compose the owning class, live mostly off of investments, which include stocks, bonds, rents, mineral royalties, and other property income. The latter live mostly off of wages, salaries, and fees. Even though this difference is blurred by the range of incomes between and even within these two groups, fundamentally the way they relate to the means of production, that being either owning capital or factories, workplaces, mineral wealth, land, etc., or working for capital without owning any themselves, is what defines their class character. The small business owner, who is driven out of the market by the thousands each year, falls into the same capitalist class, although they're usually delineated by their small petty capitalist status, unlike large corporate capitalists. Likewise, factory and service workers are as much workers as professionals, managers, and the like, even though the latter may live lifestyles which makes them self-identify as middle or even upper middle class. The nuance in this analysis is deep, but the core is this. There are two large class clusters, one who employs workers while owning everything, and the rest, the vast majority of humanity, who are employed and work for the former without owning much if any capital at all. See this video for a deeper dive. So, as the owning capitalist class consolidates more wealth underneath itself, even cannibalizing those smaller than themselves within the same class, the working majority are further pushed to the brink. Inflation eats away at your income, wages are stagnant and real terms are actually falling, wage theft and surplus value extraction are steaming ahead without so much as a peep. To quote Parenti, workers' wages represent only a portion of the wealth created by their labor. The average private sector employee works two hours for herself or himself and six or more hours for the boss. 
The portion that goes to the owner is what Marx called surplus value, the source of the owner's wealth. Capitalists themselves have a similar concept, value added in manufacture. In 2000, workers employed in manufacturing alone produced at least $1.64 trillion in value added, as reported by the U.S. Census Bureau, for which they were paid $363 billion in wages, or less than one-fourth of the market value created by their labor. Workers employed by Intel and Exxon received only about one-ninth the value added, and in industries such as cigarettes and pharmaceuticals, the workers' share was a mere one-twentieth. In the last half century, the overall average rate of value added, the portion going to the owner, in the United States more than doubled, far above the exploitation rate in other industrialized countries. We'll quote Parenti a lot today. What does that teach you? That you should definitely read more Parenti. This presents itself, contrary to the often heard myth of the middle class, as severe wealth inequality. The top 1% own more than 50% of the nation's wealth, in total and in real terms, be they stocks, investments, bonds, resources, land, or any other assets. In essence, a minute percentage of the population owns more than the combined wealth of 90% of people. Even for those working families that own some investments or stocks, they're often of insignificant amounts, with them almost entirely being under $2,000, if they have any at all. If you were to factor in debt, mortgages, and other responsibilities, the vast majority of American families have practically no real assets, and in some terms, even negative value. Those self-made fairy tales are, well, just that, fairy tales. Most people die in the class to which they were born. Meanwhile, the absolute richest rarely worked for their money, with inheritance bringing in the lion's share of wealth over several generations. With skyrocketing corporate profits, there is ever-rising income inequality. Marx said, there must be something rotten in the very core of a social system which increases its wealth without diminishing its misery. And that rings ever true. Investment growth, which is usually reserved only to the very wealthy, has grown up to three times faster than income from work. Since the 90s, the 500 largest US industrial corporations more than doubled their assets while eliminating over 5 million jobs. Since then, and especially during COVID, they've reported year after year of record profits. In fact, the sheer level of wealth development seems eerily more like a wealth transfer, in which the bottom 90% lost trillions in wealth and the top gained trillions in wealth. To complete the poetry, they also find many loopholes to avoid any possible way of paying back that stolen wealth into society by dodging and politically securing reductions in taxes year in and year out without consequence. All the while, real incomes for the rest of us fall. The power of the wealthy business class is unlike any other. Through massive networks of representatives and companies, these corporations and their owners control the rate of technological development and availability of livelihoods. They relegate whole communities to destitution when they export the industries overseas for cheaper labor markets. They devour environmental resources, stripping forests and toxifying the land, water and air, while creating conditions of scarcity for millions of people at home and abroad. A small number of giant corporations control most of the US economy. The trend is towards ever greater concentrations as giant companies are swallowed up by supergiants in industries such as oil, pharmaceuticals, telecommunications, media, health insurance, weapons manufacturing, and banking. Let's name a few examples. Chase Manhattan took manufacturers Hanover and Chemical Bank, which were then acquired by JP Morgan. Three years later, JP Morgan Chase bought up Bank One in a $58 billion deal that created the second largest US banking company. Verizon took over MCI for $6.7 billion, while Sprint and Nextel merged for $35 billion. Oil titans such as Exxon and Mobil merged, while Chevron took over Gulf and then consolidated with Texaco. To quote Parenti again, The enormous sums expended on these acquisitions could be better spent on new technologies and production. Over the past 25 years, US corporation giants spent only $2 trillion on research and development, but $20 trillion on mergers and acquisitions, great expenditures of no real social value. Such mergers benefit the big shareholders, creditors, and top executives, but leave consumers and small suppliers with fewer choices and higher prices. These entities that drive all these mergers, further consolidating power over the economy, which drives everything in society, are carried out to the benefit of that small sliver of the population discussed before. This puts an indescribable amount of power in a small handful of families, which use that power to win political concessions and change for themselves. The Rockefellers are an excellent, although not the only, example. They hold stakes in just about every industry in most countries on Earth. The Rockefellers or their associates sit on the board of many of the largest oil companies, titans of industry and banks. They've even held political office at the level of president, vice president, top cabinet positions, the governorships of several states, key positions in the Federal Reserve Board, the CIA, foreign relations positions, US Senate and House of Representatives. And that's only one of these hyper-influential families. With all this centralization of capital and power, all the rest of us are worse off for it. 
in standard American mythology, corporations are held sacred as job providers. To quote Parente, the top 200 transnational corporations account for more than a quarter of the world's economic activity, while employing hardly one one hundredth of one percent of the world's workforce. The capitalists seek to raise profitability by downsizing, meaning laying off workers, speed-ups, making the diminished workforce toil faster and harder, downgrading, reclassifying jobs to lower wage categories, and using more and more part-time and contract labor, meaning hiring people who receive no benefits, seniority paid vacations, or steady employment. Tens and hundreds of thousands of well-paying manufacturing jobs have been eliminated through the above measures. Meanwhile, the vast majority of new employment is in precarious, insecure gig or other temporary economy nonsense. Of course, cutting jobs leads to less buying power for the majority of the population. Less buying power means less consumption, which leads to crises of overproduction and recession. More stuff is produced than there is demand for it, as people simply cannot buy, or choose not to buy, those same goods or services they produce. This is a catastrophe for the working class, and even small capitalists, where small-time competition is eliminated, unions are weakened, the reserve army of labor is strengthened further, depressing wages, and the large capitalists walk off with massive bailouts and bonuses, even when their own companies or banks go under. To quote, during recent recessions, corporate profits grew to record levels as companies squeezed more output from each employee while paying less in wages and benefits. Nowhere was this more evident than the recent COVID situation. With an increasingly bleak employment picture also comes a capitalist favorite, inflation. Annual inflation rates as low as 3% still nonetheless erode buying power over just a few years. Currently, the US inflation rate sits at 8%. A common lie is that higher wage demands are what drive inflation. They claim that higher wages mean higher production costs and as a result end up in higher prices. Looking at the facts though, prices and profits have risen far quicker than wages. Those fields which account for the vast majority of household spending, food, fuel, housing and healthcare, are also usually badly compensated, aside from a few exceptions, and are amongst the most inflationary. Prices rise, but wages have stayed stagnant, and even fallen in real terms. It isn't workers pushing up prices, it's the profit motive. To quote Parenti yet again, the wage price inflation spiral is usually really a profit price spiral, with the worker more the victim than the cause of inflation. This is not to deny that by depressing wages, business is sometimes able to maintain a slower inflation creep while pocketing bigger profits. As financial power is concentrated in fewer hands, prices are more easily manipulated. Instead of lowering prices when sales drop, the big monopoly firms often raise them to compensate for the decline, as happened with some companies in the 2009 recession. Prices are also pushed up by withholding distribution, as in 2005 when the petroleum cartels created artificial oil and gasoline scarcities that mysteriously disappeared after the companies jacked up their prices and reaped record profits. There's a lot more nuance to this discussion, obviously, but that can't be fully covered in a 20 minute video. The point, however, is clear. Massive corporations consolidate more and more underneath themselves and have undeservedly massive influence over every facet of our lives. This is a situation that cannot be solved within the capitalist system itself. And if you're curious about solutions, then I can recommend these two videos here. That's all for this time. If you enjoy what I do, then please consider supporting me on Patreon. It really does help. 